Early on, I was standing by one of our fountains, and I overheard somebody say, well, I never knew water could do that before. And, and that phrase struck in my mind. I thought, maybe that should be our judgment if we hear that. So we take a, one of the most ordinary substances on the planet. We all take it for granted. We don't normally look at it even twice. And if we can bring out an aspect of its personality or, or its essence or its being, that will be a pretty good achievement. And then I had, uh, in the fairly early days of the company, we'd done, a, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen features. And someone called me up, somebody that I, I guess I'd gone to school with. And he said, I just saw a fountain, da 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 shopping center. Was that yours? And said, yes, it was. He said, I knew it. I, I know your work. And there's just some quality to it that without reading a sign or anything, it's yours. So so we always look for those ways of just catching you know people's interest in the most ordinary thing in the world and allowing them to see it freshly with the you know the eyes of a child when they when you see something new for the first time that's a challenge because water's all around us but that's really the goal i'm srini rao and this is the unmistakable creative podcast where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements built thriving businesses written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Mark, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Well, it's such a treat to be here. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure to have you here. So I found out about you by way of your publicist. And when I saw the words, the guy who designed the fountains of the Bellagio, I was like, what? I'm like, that is a spectacle of epic proportions. Whoever can create something like that is somebody I have to talk to. Uh, but before we get into all of that, uh, I wanted to start by asking, what is one of the most important things that you learned from one or both of your parents that have influenced and shaped who you've become and what you've ended up doing with your life? You, you know, it was probably, by example, hard work. Uh, my dad uh, uh, is a recession child. He wanted to be a writer, very good writer, uh, got a number of stories published, was partway through a book, and then the recession came and he had a big family quit and, you know, ha- had to work. And um, and he would, uh, late, late at night, I'd hear the old, you know, the old <clears throat> royal typewriter down in the, down in the den clicking away, but... But dad would, would, and he was a great dad. He would, you know, want to play catch with me uh, in the weekends and all that stuff. But then he'd go back in and have dinner and he'd be in, at his desk doing doing work. And my mom was, my mom worked for the FBI up until two weeks or three weeks or something like that before I was born. You, they were, there weren't female agents in those days, but, uh, and there weren't cell phones either. So she was on the other end of a landline and the agents, if they were on a hot case, had to call in every hour. So, you know, somebody knew they weren't shot or whatever. And she worked the Bugsy Malone case with the agents in the field and she on the inside. So that's wow. some hard work to do. Yeah. What <clears throat> advice did they give you about potential career paths? Because I mean, what you do for a living is not something that anybody would pick out of a, you know, high school guidance counselor's list of recommendations. I mean, I, which is pretty much like anybody I've interviewed. It's not, you know, a career that you, you know, end up in by, right. um, by choice. It seems like almost accidental. You know, the answer to that is they didn't push me into anything, but whatever I wanted to do. And a few of the possible choices along the way were a bit on the crazy side. They were just 100% supportive. And I was one of those kids. I, 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 well, you know how many people you ask today, even even, even young people in their, I, I don't know, upper teens, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you get a lot of, gee, I don't know, or uh, I don't know, I guess I'll go into business, um, which I don't have a super love for hiring MBAs, because I figured that was typically the default category for people who never went, knew what they wanted to do when they grew up. Yeah. Uh, that's rude, but but I'll say it anyway. Uh, but it, I can remember when I was little, going to the the kids' library, and and uh, be, I fell in love with Roy Chapman Andrews, who was a paleontologist who discovered the first dinosaur egg in the Gobi Desert. And then I fell in love with spelunking and thought I wanted to be a cave explorer all, all my life. Then I wanted to be a chemist, and and but it always came back to it to kind of circled around something. Um, when we were nine. We went to Disneyland for the first time. Now, this is a drive across the desert, no divided uh, freeway or anything, because this would have been in the early 60s, from Salt Lake City to Los Angeles. Uh, we would leave it, f- no air conditioning in our uh, second or third hand car. We'd leave about four in the morning to get past the worst of the desert heat. And we pulled up at Disneyland and we walked through that gate. Uh, and I was nine. And I thought, 
this is if you can't be God, literally being Walt Disney or at least working for him and creating, you know, magical lands and places and experiences has, has got to be. It's so always circled back to that. And, and of course, I, I did spend five or six years working there, which I was lucky to do. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that what is <clears throat> striking to me about this story is that you had this sort of moment when you were really young. And I think a lot of people have those, but most people don't recognize them for what they are um, and often do nothing with them. Why do you mm-hmm. think that you had the foresight to see that there's something just magical about what you what you saw here and that that would shape what you wanted to do with your life? I, I think I was uh, born gifted with with an intense sense of curiosity, and that is such a driver. So, so I would, uh, you know, uh, watch uh, uh, Don Herbert, who was Mister Wizard or something, on Saturday morning TV, and I get really interested in that. And then I'd, in those days, you could buy some rather um, um, uh, dangerous chemicals in the kids' chemistry set, and, and so I, you know, I just want to find out about that. Um, and then, you know, yeah, yeah, let me turn the clock back for you. When I went to the University of Utah, which is a, as a, a state resident, wonderful, wonderful campus, big campus, tuition was, I think, $145 a quarter. Wow. <laughs> so even though we were not we were on the poor side, uh, it was no rush to get through college, to, you know, because you couldn't afford the tuition. So my degree in civil engineering, which is a, t- a four-year degree, I took five and a half years to complete, not because I was, was on the dumb side, but because I I fell in love with uh, other other disciplines, I took as a civil engineer, you have to take three quarters of, of physics. I took 12 and, and some of them were in optics and it was just fascinating, I thought. And then that was the time when um, the original television version of Mission Impossible came out and they would do the, remember the latex masks and the disguises and, and all that great stuff. And so I went, just went, waltzed into the theater department. I found the the uh, the professor there who taught lighting design and stage makeup, Bill Barber. It turns out, uh, and I took classes from him as a, as a civil engineer. It turns out he would disappear every once in a while for a few weeks because he was employed by the CIA to help disguise their agents. So he's a very interesting guy. But those are the crazy things you find if you if you don't tether yourself to. Uh, racing through school. I, uh, my my son's in college now. My daughter will begin in a year. And when we go through these orientations, one of the recurring themes, maybe it's the high cost of tuition, but the, the counselors will say, well, if you really focus, you might get your degree in three and a half years. And, and we've told our kids, take, I mean, don't waste it, but but it's it's an opportunity to try things, to learn things. Take, uh, you know, take, take, five years or, or, or a little more and, and stuff way out of your, out of your presumed major. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because I've, I've talked to numerous people about this and you know, the way our education system socializes us is to commit to a path and it actually discourages yeah. curiosity and exploration. You know, it's kind of in a lot of ways, like a fast food menu. It's like, here are the majors you could choose. Here are the potential career paths that, you know, they yeah. might lead to. And, you know, people are kind of forced into boxes so early in their lives. I mean, I, you know, when I went to go speak to my high school AP English teachers class after I got my book deal, I was amazed at how worried they were about what they plan to do with their lives. I'm like, you haven't even left high school yet. Granted, I, I know this all too well because that's what I was like at 20. Um, yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, and if you, you know, as somebody who had this experience of really, you know, taking a more exploratory approach to college, um, what would you change and, and how would we go about doing that more importantly? Well, that's such a great question, particularly now since, um, and I'm, I, you can tell I'm a big proponent of education. I've been, I'm tossing in my mind the uh, current administration's plan for a lot more preschool. And I'm thinking, is that good or will that, I, I mean, you have to almost audition to get in a good uh, preschool. And then and then most of those two years are spent preparing you to get into a school with a good kindergarten. And that's <laughs> and preparing you to get into a great middle school, which is spent preparing you to get into a fabulous high school, which is – and I don't have to finish that paragraph, right? And then and then I guess it's all just I, – I, if you really just run that out, it's just preparing you to get buried at a fabulous funeral home, right? Well, I mean, where, where does that stop? Where can you start living in the present instead of – preparing for the next stage. Yeah. It's such a waste of time. I don't mean it's a waste of time to be active and learning, but if you're focused on, on tomorrow, you, you don't even notice today. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because I think for young people, especially ambitious ones, you know, I went to what is arguably an elite school, which is Berkeley. I mean, it's not Harvard or Stanford oh, or Yale. But yeah. in environments like that, people are incredibly future oriented. They really don't. And I know this because that was me. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so I guess you know, the the thing I wonder, I mean, based on your experience, the fact that you have kids, what would you say to parents who are listening to this uh, about encouraging exploration and curiosity in their kids? Well, I, I was trying to make a point to some younger people the other day about, and there was some talk about, well, do I, do I really want to get them into PhD? Or, and, and, you know, that's great, but, it, but it's sort of like, well, the classic things, you learn more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, I was, I was, we were walking along and I was looking down the sidewalk and there were some cracks between the pieces of concrete and the stones nearby. And I said, let's look for life. Look down at your feet. Where do you see a little blade of grass or, or a little dandelion or something sprouting up? Not out of the middle of a big old block of granite or cement, but where those two, maybe a, a stone is butting up against a tree root or something. And, and I, I tried to spin that into the, the, the metaphor of the most interesting stuff in new life comes when two dissimilar objects or fields of study or human beings bump into each other. And one of the really fun things about wet for me, uh, uh, I say, boy, if you're ever out and, 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 and have the time to come by sometime, I'd love to show you through. But we have a super fun campus. And we don't, um, discipline-wise, we don't have a lot of anybody. But by golly, we've got one of just about everybody. I mean, we've got, you know, textile designers, optical engineers, uh, firmware developers, uh, painters, illustrators, dance choreographers. Uh, I mean, you, you could thumb through, well, in my day, thumb through the physical college catalog today, scan it online. And uh, I mean, we've had, I don't think we have an astronaut at the moment. We've got an Academy Award winner, uh, a uh, uh, So You Think You Can Dance uh, a winner. Uh, I mean, it, when we're doing fountain design, you, you, you go figure out how that comes together. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but it does. Uh, yeah, you know, I always like to refer to Steve Jobs' fabulous um, commencement talk where he reminds everybody that, that he was a computer guy, but he, he stuck his nose into a calligraphy class and decided to just sneak in and audit it. And that later became the genesis for the whole, you, you know, beautiful written form of script on the Mac instead of the typewritery kind of monospaced lettering. And, and I, I, I spoke to a, a group of um, engineering students earlier this week, came by for tour, and I said, anything that interests you, Learn it, throw yourself into it. Don't don't have somebody say, well, what does that have to do with your major? I can make, I made them all a promise that whatever they learn, they will use at some point in their life. And that may be the thing that distinguishes them from the, from the folks who just followed the yellow brick road. DraftKings Sportsbook is officially live in New York State with mobile sports betting just in time for playoff season. Right now, you can place a bet from anywhere in New York with DraftKings Sportsbook. To add to the excitement, DraftKings is giving new customers a special offer that you don't want to miss. Bet just $5 on any playoff game and win 280 in free bets if your team is victorious. All New York customers can also get in on DraftKings Hammer the Over promotion. For every 5,000 bettors who take the over for Saturday night's game, the point total will lower by half a point. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code ACASTPOD and get 56 to 1 odds on any team. Bet just $5 and win 280 in free bets if your team wins. That's promo code ACASTPOD this week at DraftKings Sportsbook. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for full details. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New York. Gambling problem? Call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-3 six nine you know it's funny you say that because i i have an econ degree and i thought what a you know useless degree i'm never going to use this um you know i, I still to this day remember sitting in a, you know in a final class at berkeley it was environmental economics and i'm sitting here listening to this guy talk to me about how to use a utility function to maximize the amount of milk that i can get out of a cow and i'm thinking when the hell is this ever going to matter <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and I read The Wealth of Nations recently, and mm. it was one of the things where I started to just see my business through that lens. And I realized I was like, oh, wow, that degree actually came back sure. full circle, but it took almost 20 years. Yeah, yeah. What's the, what's the series of books uh, uh, 
or uh, Thinkonomics, or something crazy nomics, and it's written by a couple of economists who just an, analyze the darndest things, you, you know, through that economic lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely, it's just it's a different camera lens to look at life through, and you see it very differently. It's like yeah. looking, uh, I guess, looking with an infrared lens or or something that is not visible light at a subject you're used to seeing in in RB, RGB. Yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of, of looking at the world through different lenses, uh, you know, the average civil engineer doesn't become a fountain designer. They usually are, you know, building bridges. How in the world do you get from studying civil engineering to designing fountains? Well, if I may, I'll take two, two little short snippets along the way. Yeah. There, there, there was a uh, there was a bit of uh, what did you what did you call it? method to my madness? See, when I was uh, I mean, I'm not I'm not a. A, 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 any, a genius by by any stroke. I just I just tell everybody I work really hard. But so I'm in civil engineering, and I, I'm, so I'm, I've got a pretty good technical mind, pretty good background. But when we had to give class presentations, oh my gosh, are they boring? Because these you, you know, engineers don't aren't really into standing up; they're scared to be in front of people or what have you. And then I was taking these classes over in theater. And over there, of course, it's all about being on stage and, and presenting. Um, but they, gosh, they couldn't build the simplest prop in the world and, and have it not fall apart. So I could have been a relatively, I, I hate to use the word mediocre, let's say mediocre plus engineer and been a superhero in all my theater classes. And I could have made kick-ass presentations. I not only could, but did presentations in engineering because of my theater background. So sometimes it's good, you, you know, to, to step across the border and, and enjoy the fun of being there. Um also, a few in those days, I, I hope it's sincerely improved, but in those days, there were a little better dating choices in the theater department for an engineer than there were in his own field. As well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the story I was going to tell you about supporting parents. So, so mom and dad, they, they, and it wasn't a lot of cost. I lived at home and I, and I, I went through the university mm-hmm. there. And then I applied to a number of schools, and, and a professor said, Yeah, you, you ought, really ought to think of Stanford. Uh, it's a very interesting school. So I applied and was accepted there, obviously, in civil engineering. And so we're driving again across the desert, this this time the Salt Flats, going to Northern Cal. And I remember sitting, I can picture sitting, my dad was driving, mom was on the right side, and I was sitting behind dad. <clears throat> and I, I took a deep breath and I said, dad, yeah, dad, I, I don't think I want to be a civil engineer. <laughs> now, the tuition at Stanford was not $145 a yeah. quarter. You know, it was, they were going to deplete the family savings. He said, well, why? Why don't you want to do that? And I said, well, you know, if you're a civil engineer, basically your goal is to design and build things that do not move. I mean, bridges, you do not want them to move. Skyscrapers, you do not want them to move, right? As in tip over. And I said, I I like moving things. I like moving stuff. So I I want to poke around when I get there. And I went and saw the dean of engineering when I got there and and shared that story uh, uh, in a little more serious vein. And he said, what are your GREs? And I had a pretty good score. So he said, oh, you can be whatever you want. So I went into mechanical engineering. And there was an orientation. And, and the head of the mechanical engineering uh, division said, well, we have three groups here. We have machine design, which I thought, well, that sounds like me. And then we have the thermodynamics stuff, the heat and the energy and stuff. And I was, uh, that's amazing, but it wasn't my cup of tea. And he said, then we've got a third little group. And I don't even know how to describe them, so I'm going to let uh, – uh, Dr. McKim, who heads it up, describe it. It's called product design. He said, we really don't claim them completely because they're half in the College of Engineering and half in the College of Fine Arts. And I thought, boy, this sounds great. It was a two-year master's program instead of the one, so I had to break that double X news to my folks tuition-wise. But there again, you know, it was this cross-fertilization. Uh, and I struggled because I didn't have a lot of art training uh, with all my engineering studies. Um but that was that's that's I, if you came through wet, you'd see it patterned on many of the things that I learned at Stanford in that bizarre program. One of the professors, uh, Dr. Fadiman, well, he was on loan to the engineering school, but he was from the Department of Psychology. And um, we just had crazy, crazy professors from all over campus come in and, and kind of stir the pot. To, and it was uh, um, the whole program was about, you know, being creative, inventive and stepping across the line. And so. And then I went to Disney, and at that time particularly, I mean, Walt Disney was no longer with us, but I got to work with most of his uh, peers, you know, who are still there, and, and a rich, creative bunch. So I've been very, very blessed with the experiences I've had. I, I think I just keep my eyes open for them. I mean, I do that at least and, and try to step into those um, 
calligraphy rooms that Steve Jobs peeked into when I when I when I see one with the door cracked open. Yeah. So how do you get from Disney to to you know wet? I mean, like I am so fascinated by you know the work that you know like people do with water in particular as a tenure surfer. Uh, I have this just you know, immense love for anything water. And I still to this day remember the first time I saw the mountains at the Bellagio. And I remember sitting there. It was probably when I was in college. I was with my parents. And I'm like, you know what, Dad? I, you know, I was a freshman in college. And I was like, I'm going to be a billionaire. And I'm going to have whoever designed this, design this in front of my house. And he just looked at me and rolled his eyes. He was like, that's great. Um, but I, to this day, like, it's just one of those things that, you know, like, I don't really like Vegas, but that is one of those most yeah, yeah. beautiful things I've ever seen. But how, yeah. So, I mean, how do you go from Disney to this? And then we'll, then I really want to get into the actual creative process for how all this happens. Well, thank you for saying that. Um, I, I will say one thing there are, I'm sure shorter, faster, better ways to getting to be a billionaire than, than going into the found business. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I always liked to play with water as a kid. Uh, Dad built for my brother and I a, a really cool sandbox behind the garage, and 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 I first thing I did was screw two garden hoses together so they'd reach and flood it, you know, and, and then build sand dams, and which I guess a little of my pre civil engineering coming up, um, and play in the snow and build. I built. I remember building some kind of ice dams after a big storm so that all the cars driving down the hill that we were our house was was near on the road would have to swerve out of the way of the big lake. I could dam. Um, so there's something about water that's uh, fast, you know, has always been fascinating to me. And then in civil engineering, well, one of the reasons also it took me a little longer. I was the first civil engineer in the history of the University of Utah to to go through the honors program, uh, which is a which is a, a, an accoutrement. I mean, an add on to any other degree, but it's intense liberal, liberal arts. And I thought I, I don't know why they somebody talked me into it. And a couple of great things came out of it, by the way. Uh, the class, I, I, University of Utah, had, what, I don't know, probably in those days, even 40,000 students or something. I don't, except for one chemistry class, I don't think I ever had a class my whole university there were more than like 15 people. I had a few classes of four. So I really, that, that made the experience really rich. Then I went to expensive Stanford and I was in huge classes a lot. Um, but, but I had that, uh, that honors program, but that required us to actually write and publish a written thesis, not for a master's degree, but for a baccalaureate degree. And so it, it, I say it was the first. I had a friend who, uh, uh, who was also in the program, and we did it together, and we were trying to think of what to do for a thesis. We were sitting in the back of a fluid mechanics class. In those days, nothing on video. It was the old 16 millimeter, click, 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 you know, black and white films to show things. And the lesson was was a, a was a little movie on something called laminar flow, which is uh, if you if you take all the turbulence out of water, it's kind of like if you take all the turbulence out of light, you get a laser. All the little photons are moving, you know, the same. It's just the beam. Well, you, you can sort of do the same thing with water. And Dave Ayer, my friend, wanted to become an architect, and I wanted to go to Disney. And we thought, what can we do? We and the other kids were talking about thesis projects and sewage treatment plants, whatever, whatever. Let's see if we could scale that up to human size, architectural size, and make these clear streams of water. And in the film, they're they're like matchstick size, right? They're like this is like three inch high stream about the diameter of a toothpick. And so we set about to do that, and we did. And the uh, dad of a friend of my girlfriend at the time was building a a, a little new apartment building, and he gave us some money to actually build uh, a model of our thesis project in the lobby, which was super fun. Um, so why am I telling all that? Oh, fountain. So so I have a thesis published on axisymmetric laminar fluid flow it, it applied in an artistic or architectural um, installation. And then when I went to Stanford and had to do a, a lot of different projects, I, I pursued uh, you know that as, as, as one path. And then when I interviewed at Disney, you know, I, ta-da, I, 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 instead of just having a you know resume with classes and grades, well, I had a lot of projects because I'm a I'm a real project kid, but I, you know I I showed that off and 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 got hired in there. Hmm. Everyone knows how to get in shape, just eat well and exercise. But if it's so easy, why do so many diets fail? Because knowing what to do and doing it are very different. Getting fit is about eating well, exercising, and doing those two things consistently. Sounds simple, right? But consistency is incredibly hard when you're relying on willpower. 
Most people force themselves to eat a certain way until they can't do it anymore. My Body Tutor eliminates the need for willpower with practical, sustainable behaviors that change your mindset, psychology, and habits. And the best part is their daily, highly personal accountability. Without accountability, it's too easy to make and break promises to yourself. But at My Body Tutor, you work with your coach each and every day until you reach your goal. Try them for a month to see how effective daily accountability is. And you'll be protected by their 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. So it's a win-win situation no matter what. What are you waiting for? Visit mybodytutor.com today. So what I wonder is, is, you know, so like I said, when I saw this for the first time, you know, of course, I, I didn't have the sort of creative insight that I do now from thousands of interviews. Um, but, you know, just to understand what the hell goes into something this complex? I mean, you know, like you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, you have all these people because you, I think that that has always been the thing now, now that I'm talking to you that has struck me about it is you take something that is, you know, basically, you know, a material and you humanize it in a way, mm -hmm. you know, you bring water to life. It's like, wow, these are, you know, like every you know, section of that fountain, it's like, oh, there's a person dancing like you, you know, the music, all of it. I mean, so start, uh, you know, which I, I realize is an insane question, but like, how does it even start? Like, how do you conceive an idea this grand? Um, and, and, you know, was it Steve Wynn coming to you and be like, yo, I need you to build this or you know, how, how does it even begin? Well, that one began, um, we had done some smaller projects as well. I don't remember how many people we had under if, probably 30 people or something, maybe in the company in those days. And Don Brinkerhoff was a, a, a very well known landscape architect, uh, and had done Steve's properties. He'd done the landscaping around the Mirage hotel and so forth. And I guess Steve told him, uh, oh, Don, I want to build a big lake. I got this idea of doing kind of this Italian themed, uh, hotel called Bellagio. And, and Steve was thinking of, uh, oh, maybe we'll put water skiers out front or whatever, whatever, whatever. But maybe I'd like to try a fountain. And Don says, well, you got to talk to Mark Fuller. I've done a couple of projects with him. So Steve flew my wife and I up there. And and, and we had a dinner. And uh, Steve is, um, and I've learned a lot from him. He's amazing. He's, you know, he's very nearly blind from retinitis pigmentosa. Never, never complains about it at all. But so... He's very visionary, and he knows what, uh, what will touch and appeal to people. And he said, Mark, he said, I want to do this big lake. And it has to be, when, you, when the people are there, they, they have to feel they're not in Las Vegas. We're, we're not going to do colored lights. We're not going to do flashing, anything. It, it, it has to completely remove you from that experience. And he said, the other requirement is, he's, I love music, because he was buddies with Frank Sinatra and, all, and the Rat Pack and, and just a bunch of people through his life. It has to be integrally tied to music in a very sophisticated way. And thirdly, you have promised me it'll be the best and biggest thing you'll ever do in your life. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's an interesting promise to try to make somebody like Steve Wynn. Yeah. Um, but but and he said, and and he said, this is a big deal to me. It was three years before the the hotel would open, he, and he said, I've never been really happy with the the volcano in front of the. A mirage, it sort of looks like a, <clears throat> you know, big rock thing with colored water squirting out of the top. So let's try getting to know each other. And why don't you take, I don't remember what he gives a year or something, and and see what you can do that. So we, we redid that. Um, we, we had a lot of, of um, and then we built a big mock-up here in our parking lot. And Steve and his family came down. I mean, I mean we this is my theater, see prop building and set building. And Steve, when we invited him down, he said, I was expecting to see something the size of a coffee table and you're going to show me how the water looks like lava or something. No, this was as, as big as, uh, I don't know what I want to say, a two-story, two-stack garage or something, all sculpted and unlit. And we're in Hollywood, right? So even then, I, I, a lot of my friends and stuff were, were scenic designers. And, and, and we, we blew Steve away and he admitted that. And that's a hard thing to do. Um, I guess that's an, if I'm going to slip another piece of advice into anybody who's uh, listening, it's always, always try to really um, surprise the heck out of people by, you know, going, going further than even maybe you, you yourself expected. It's it, first of all, it's just plain fun. Um, <clears throat> and second of all, it, it guarantees you that your, your competition and see, I don't, I don't think of our competition at WED as being other fountain companies because a bunch of them copy, it, it, you know, one way or good or bad or not very much so what we've done in the past but 
if you were to ask me, well, Mark, who's your biggest competitor? I would say the last project we did, because the world expects us now to top that with the next one. Like I said, they probably say that to Steven Spielberg or something, right, about yeah. making movies. Um, and and so that that's that started us. We did that. He loved the Mirage. Um, he was he Steve was very leery of technology. Um, he's very much a showman, and one of the hardest challenges. And if you remember standing there, you don't see any nozzles come up out of that lake surface. Yeah. It's just a beautiful lake, and getting those little babies to appear on cue and disappear. And there are thousands of them. Uh, was was as hard as any other aspect of the fountain. And I learned that from Steve. I think whatever few fountains we'd done before that, the, the nozzles probably all poked up. But that gives the whole weight thing away. You can say, oh, there's going to be a circle of jets here or something. It's like if you had all the actors and props on the stage for every scene of a play or something, you know, it wouldn't, wouldn't be anything left to your imagination or surprise in the next scene. Yeah. Um, and, and then he was, he was really afraid. Uh, he, we, we, we flew to Disneyland together and we showed him what we call the shooters. Those are the big ones that go up like rockets. They're very, I call them a staccato part of the fountain, you know, boom, they're fired by compressed air, which is amazingly uh, green and energy efficient compared to pumps and the traditional ways of moving water. But I said, Steve, we need, we need the legato side too, to do music well. And, and we developed these, um, kind of underwater robots, the ones that you can see sway around. And there's a whole story that I won't, I won't take the time to tell you. I went back to the University of Utah and had one of my college professors help us. They had a small company on robotics. but um, And that that's that's what came out of it. A lot of it didn't work um, uh, of the first time. I mean, I, it did work by opening day, but, you know, uh, right up till it, you've got 200 and I think it was 216 of these underwater Robots that have never been done before that have to move with the the grace of a of a ballet dancer. Uh, we learned a lot of choreography on that from um, Kenny Ortega, who was if, uh-huh. if you know the name, yep. yeah, Michael Jackson. Like Kenny, yeah, yeah, exactly. Kenny and I are going to Dubai uh, a week after next together. It will be really fun. We've worked together on and off ever since then. But he said, wow. Mark, he he said I can get humor, I can get melodrama, I can get grandeur out of your jets, just like I can out of a human performer. And of course, that's, that's what we strive to do. Wow. Okay. So, so many questions come from that. First, uh, briefly about, about Steve, when, what is it that enables somebody at his level to achieve at the level that he does? Because from what I, what little research I've done, I know there have been a few books written about him. There's not a whole hell of a lot you can find about the guy. And I wonder if that's by design. But from what I'm told, he was a tobacco salesman in Las Vegas who basically, you know, became this cultural icon. What is it enables like the visionary thinking of somebody who is like that? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I wish I've had, I, I've spent a lot of time with Steve during Bellagio. His CFO came out to me once and said, Mark, you do know Steve's spending more time with you than he is with his wife. He, he, <laughs> <pretty> amazing. <laughs> um, but he wasn't a tobacco salesman, but it was a liquor delivery. Okay. Salesman. I, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I knew I didn't have the story completely right. Steve is. God, I wish I could. Uh, wish I could sum him. He he pushes you so hard. I mean, he and he can be brutal. Oh my God! I've been uh, the the. Uh, well, I'll tell you a quick a quick story. Just as we were starting to fill the Bellagio Lake, and it it takes a good number of days to fill because of, of the water volume. And we were within a few days of filling it. And I was in another client's office or something here in L.A. And the, the uh, receptionist said, there's a Mr. Wynn on the phone for you. And I went in and picked it up. And I, Hello, Steve. And he started to scream at me like you cannot imagine. You could hear it all over the office, I'm sure. Because someone had told him that we had messed up and, and those little nozzles wouldn't be hidden. That when the wind blew and there would be waves, you know, troughs and, and peaks, that, that you would see the nozzles. And I was pretty sure we'd calculated that. But... I said, Steve, I, I'm sure we're on top of that. If we're not, we'll fix it. And and he was pretty pretty articulate in telling me he wished he'd never met me. Wish he could burn my contract <laughs> up with him. And, and and you know, and Steve's Steve is um is a powerful guy. Uh, and anyway, a few days later, we filled it, and the problem it was okay. Now Steve is a is a exceptionally handsome man. He radiates the sense of power and and intelligence, which he has. And I'm a small person, I'm about five foot seven. <clears throat> and, and so I'm standing, I'm thinking, now we've got to now create all these shows, and I'm sure I'm going to be working with Mr. Wynn long into the future. And that was a colorful conversation. So I walked up to Steve, took three deep breaths, and said, Steve, could we talk for a minute about that phone call a couple of days ago? And you know what he did? He stepped closer to me and he put his arm around my shoulder like a big bear hug. And he said, Mark, 
you just have to know I was not mad at you. We just have to do fantastic work. We can't fall short on anything. I'm I'm just passionate about the project. It wasn't about me, Matty. It was but I we can't let anything go wrong. And and he said, and and if you thought I was yelling at you, I'm sorry. And I thought, I'm gonna remember this day. How many billionaires tell somebody that they're sorry? Yeah. And I became a fan of Steve Wynn on that very day, and he continued to once in a while, scare me a little bit, but always inspire me and my team to to get even more out of ourselves than we thought we could. And that's that's his gift. He, he, you can see it in in everything he's touched. Yeah. Stupid question. What's the water bill for like an average one of these fountain shows? Um, well, the power. I, I don't know the water bill because uh, some of it is I think they have they have a, a, a well or something that used to irrigate the golf course that was there formerly. Um, but, but the last time I looked several years ago, I don't think power's changed too much, about $50 a show. So you got uh, you, 5,000, I think the most they've ever had, they've had up to 30,000 people out there to, on the sidewalk to watch a show and for $50 of electricity. I think that's pretty, <laughs> that's yeah. pretty amazing. Well, talk to me about the actual design process for this. Like, you know, what, you know, from sort of conception to actual, you know, execution to the final product that we see um like does it start on pen and paper like are you guys sketching like wh- what is the ideation process for something of this magnitude yeah, it, it's exactly all of those things and a, and a lot of other things um we're really big into building uh physical models and mock-ups and 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 of course uh, uh, the wonders you can do with with cad models and 3d uh, computer models is of course fantastic and that's another tool uh, uh, you, the, uh, it's interesting sometimes when we're interviewing like a young engineer out of, out of, out of college. And, and if I say, Hey, draw me a circle, draw you a circle. Well, where, where's the computer? Can I, have you got SolidWorks installed so I can draw you a circle? And I'm thinking more like a napkin, right? And a, and a piece of paper because uh, the computers are great, but they instantly demand that you feed them all sorts of information about that circle. What should the line width be? What should the diameter be to the nearest, you know, tenth of a millimeter or something, whatever, whatever. And and when you're when you're in an ideation frame of mind, you've got this mind to hand sort of mu- uh, muscle, not just memory, but muscle connection. And if, if you watch somebody who can sketch, and we we teach sketching here here, just as they taught it to me at Stanford, just so you can get your ideas out. They don't have to be beautiful, but but they flow fast uh, at, at that way. So we do we go through all those traditional sketching. <laughs> processes like that and then um and then we build small models and we tear them apart we're not too precious about them and bigger ones and then we, we, we the place here is kind of like a movie studio we've got a big old back lot and, and something you would call probably like a sound stage uh where we control light and noise and and we end up building and we have a fantastic scenic shop wood shop and we build kind of a movie set section full scale not of the whole thing, obviously, but of a piece of it, because water, if you do a miniature thing, the, the no- nozzles may be smaller, but gravity stays at 1.0. It doesn't go down just because the, the nozzle's smaller. So you have to really see what it's going to be like. Is it going to splash too much? Is it going to be as exciting or as beautiful as you thought? So it, everything we do, it goes through this incredible uh, modeling process before we commit to, you know, construction drawings to build the actual piece. Yeah. So, okay, I and you you probably know this as well as anybody, right? You can model something down to perfection, but then when you go into an actual implementation, things go wrong. Um what what went wrong? Like you mentioned earlier there were things that weren't working and, and you know cuz you're talking about something probably with what tens of thousands of moving parts with, you know, oh, yeah. one variable yeah. that could totally screw up everything. Yeah, what you said about uh, models can fool you. Yeah, you, yes, you you get a really bright uh, a young person in here, maybe it's fresh out of college, and, they, and they're a gee whiz at, uh, you know, a, a 3D modeling program. I can do it on the screen. And I said, yeah, he's, they'll say, I can build you a fantastic 3D model of anything you can imagine. And I say, well, first of all, it won't be 3D because I can run my hand across your screen. It's, it's a, you know, it's, it's very 2D uh, looking like 3D. But yes, you can not only model everything that will work in the real world, you can model everything that won't work. Uh, you, I can, you can build me a fantastic computer model of a lightsaber. But if I ask you to build me a real one, 
you can't do it just because that model fooled you. That's called science fiction movies, right? Yeah. Um, but if, if I ask you to build a model that works, of course, then all of a sudden all the impossible, you know, physics limited things are off the table. So that's the value of doing at some stage switching to the real thing. Oh, the problems we had. Well, some of them were absolutely crazy. We 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 did what I said. We we followed our preaching and we modeled these big um, shooters. We call them. There, if you imagine a big old pipe, let's say I don't know, ten inches in diameter and and uh, <coughs> ten or twelve feet tall, you, you stick it in the lake and there's a little flapper valve on the bottom so that the water rushes in and then when it's filled to to the top because the top of it's at the water level. The, the, the little flappers go shut on the bottom. So you got this sealed pipe full of water. Now, if I if I inject a big high-pressure bubble of air in the bottom, it's kind of like if you shook a champagne bottle up, and, and then release it, the, that air bubble would expand and it pushes the water out of the top. That's the technology we use. Fantastically more energy efficient and and, uh, and green, than, <coughs> pardon my cough, um, than if we use pumps for reasons I can tell you if you're interested, but you're... Um, Probably, probably not. So I, I won't unless begged. Um, so, so we we built all those uh, shooters and we mocked them up here and, and we used air compressed at 120 psi. If you go to Home Depot and you buy a compressor for your garage or something, it, it, it'll compress air up to about 120 pounds per square inch. But to get the height we wanted at Bellagio, we wanted to go twice that 240. So we thought, well, what's the big deal? We just we you can't buy a 240 pound compressor at Home Depot. So yeah, we'll take. Uh, there's no risk in that. So we were up there. The lake was filled. Everything was full. Mr. Wynn was out there. We were just getting ready to start choreographing it. And we'd fire these shooters. And instead of, you've seen it, so you know what I mean, these missiles of water, they come out, they launch, and then then they're disappeared. The jet would stick open. So it would look like Old Faithful on a bad day would just (laughs) sputter and sputter. Better, right, uh, and, and and destroy any sense of, of of being tied to music. And you might we have what do we, what do we have over a thousand shooters of two different sizes there. But if one of them is stuck open, it's like if you if you go to if you go to a a, a, a fancy dinner and you're you're all in in whites and tails and you got a ketchup spot on your lapel. What's the only thing anybody will look at? It's that ketchup spot, right? So so one of those jets, and even Mister Wynn with with his little bit impaired. Uh, I say, what's wrong with that jet over there, Mark? And so we would send, we had, we had all of our engineers, we had about, I don't know, just under 30 of them. We sent them to dive school because the lake's about 12 feet deep. They all got the PADI certified divers licenses while they're working on the project for us. So they would, a couple of them would go out, dive to the bottom, unbolt this shooter valve, bring it up to the surface. And we figured, oh, it's probably got dirt in it. You know, it's a construction site. Some dirt got in the air piping and, you know, it's the sand in it or something. So we'd set it on the tape, work table and take it all apart to, and it was sparkling clean. And then we put it back together, go out there, dive, put it in and boom, boom, it would work like a million bucks. And then half an hour later, it would stick open again and do this horrible sputtering thing. Oh, and we were just mystified, and, and, and we're getting cl- uncomfortably close to opening. So I reached out, met met the head of the fluid mechanics department at um, Caltech, and he did a computer model, very sophisticated, a reasonably sophisticated physics model of, of what was happening. And if you've ever, like, uh, if you've ever painted something with a can of, you know, spray paint, you shake, shake, shake the little ball on the bottom, uh, or hairspray or anything like that. If you hold the button down a long time, the can gets cold in your hand because as air expands, it, uh, it, it absorbs energy to accomplish the expansion. It's a thermodynamic principle. So we had this air that we were now pressurizing to 240 psi, very highly compressed. And then when we open the valve, it, it expands to room temperature. It got so cold, uh, uh, and the professor modeled it, it was that air was dropping to minus 50 degrees. Now, this is in the lake, about 80 degree water in the middle of the summer in Las Vegas. And the air in going through that valve uh, would drop to minus 50 degrees. And also, the, there's a little bit of humidity in all air, even in Las Vegas. So that moisture would freeze. And what was happening was was actually forming an ice ball inside of the valve that would open and close, uh, just like you were at the Arctic. And then that ice would stick it. And then this takes you. This takes you to what was the Ed Ground post story where the murderer used a knife made of ice? Do you, I don't know if you remember that one. And he would murder somebody, and then when the cops came around, there was no murder weapon because it would have melted into a puddle of water. 
by the time the cops got there. So so our our our, our culprit here was these ice balls. As soon as the divers would, would take them apart and that 80 degree water would hit that ice ball, they were long since melted. There was no evidence when they got to the surface. Um, so that's a, one of the crazy problems we had to work around. Wow. You know, so one thing I wonder, because uh, I, I talked to Wallace Nichols about this. He wrote a book, which I'm sure you're probably familiar with, called The Surprising Science of Water. And you know, were, I don't know that, and I'm going to have to get that. I, I yeah, thought I. Yeah, yeah. So you know, he and I were talking about why water has the effect on people that it does. And he was, you know, he's a surfer slash marine biologist, and just you know, surfing, yeah. it makes sense to me, right? He said, you know, the minute you get into the water, you know, you you know activate the default mode network, and you know, you kind of you know are sort of like in a very different state of mind. And we actually right. had a very brief conversation about fountains. Um, and, you know, the idea was that, you know, by meeting people near bodies of water, it changes the interaction that you have with them significantly. And I thought to myself, like, all right, from now on, anytime I go on a date, I'm going to make sure there's a fountain close by. Um, <laughs> you know, Cause I don't live in California anymore, but when I did, anytime I met somebody, you know, I would have them meet me at the beach because it's especially yeah. as like podcast yeah. listeners. I'm like, all right, well, if I think you're an idiot, then at least I can get a surf session. And, <laughs> and if you're cool, then we're at this really beautiful place, but fountains in particular right. have this sort of magical quality to them almost, particularly the ones that you design. Um, why is it that they have the, the sort of psychological impact on people that they do because you know like like i said i mean i think i mean to this day anytime i've seen those fountains i don't like going to vegas and you're right it is one of the few places in vegas where you don't feel like you're in vegas but it's spellbound binding like it's mesmerizing to watch you know i mean and i wonder why that water in particular has that effect on people i i, I and i've given some thought to that and i'll tell you uh, kind of a surprising reason that I think it's true, <clears throat> and this comes from my from my theater background. In any good play, um, there's always a protagonist and an antagonist, right? Good guy, bad guy, fighting against each other, and they're they're separate individuals, of course. <clears throat> Water is simultaneously a protagonist and an antagonist. It's beautiful. We love to swim in it, like you say, uh, uh, ski on it when it's frozen, surf in it, uh, splash around. Kids love love to do it, and yet. All you have to do is turn on the television during a, a hurricane like Katrina, and you realize the terror that water can bring and, and how much, how destructive it can be. Um, I, I, I read recently that the one thing that's in common among all sailors of all navies of all nations in the world is that their greatest fear is drowning. Now, you'd think somebody who's on a boat for their you know their life would, would quickly get over that. They, they don't. So... When what water can snuff, I know if you if you have a small child at home, you have a swimming pool, and the phone rings, and you start to dash in to get it immediately, your heart will race. You think, God, thirty seconds, my, my baby could drown. So it has in itself this charm, this seductive. Uh, I mean, it's sensual when you feel it against your body, and it can take a life or or a hundred or a thousand lives, and and laugh it off. You know, that's that's an amazing property. I, I can't think of anything else. I mean, fire doesn't, fire, fire destroys a lot of stuff and, and in very small amounts we can enjoy it. But w at a grand scale, water mixes that uh, that sense of, of joy and an almost playful, uh, inconsiderate destruction uh, together. So I, I, there has to be some, you know, some way that touches us, especially when, what, what, I don't know what the number is, but what is it, we're 82% water or something physically, yeah. Um, when the, when the JPL guys go to look for life on another planet, they they don't look for life; they look for water. Because if there's no water, there ain't going to be no life. <laughs> um, and we all come from water uh, on a small scale, you know, from our mother's womb. On a large scale, uh, you know, evolved from the oceans. So so there's these hereditary million year old connections, and then there's that that psychology of something. I guess it, like if you were uh, dating a serial killer or something but you thought he or she was just so attractive you you're gonna do it anyway uh that's a crazy analogy but i want to cut that out of this this uh, talk, it's but. well you know, it's it's funny to, to you know hear you sort of talk about both the destructive and beautiful qualities of water because as a surfer you kind of experience the same thing right there are days right. when you go out there and you know you feel like the ocean is like your greatest lover and then there are days when they're like, this is the most indifferent lover on the planet who wants to basically yeah. hand my ass to me. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's it right there. Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
so, so to go back to, to you know, what Steve Wynn said, you know, about this being the greatest work of your life, it, it kind of reminds me of sort of that Elizabeth Gilbert speech, right? It's like, how do you follow and eat, pray, love? So yeah. for you, when you've done something that is this grand, this known, because I'm sure everybody listening to this probably knows about the Fountains of Blasio, and I know you've done a ton of other stuff that's also of huge magnitude, but that's kind of, in a lot of ways, I mean, to me, the minute I read that, I was like, yeah, that's that was what got me. Um, so how do you maintain a sense uh, of sort of, um, you know, creative persistence and and not be forever defined by this one thing? Yeah, like like an actor who doesn't want to be thought of as a as a as a cowboy all his life if that was yeah. his first role. Yeah. Uh, early on, so I was standing by by one of our fountains and and I overheard somebody say, "Wow, I never knew water could do that before." And and that phrase struck in my mind. I thought maybe that that should be our judgment if if we if we hear that. So so we take a one of the most ordinary substances on the planet. We all take it for granted. We don't normally look at it even twice. And if we can bring out an aspect of its personality or or its essence or its being, that that will be a pretty good achievement. And then I had uh, in the fairly early days of the company, we'd done a, I don't know maybe a couple dozen features. And someone called me up, somebody that I, I guess I'd gone to school with him. He said, I just saw a fountain, da 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 shopping center. Was that yours? And I said, yes, it was. He said, I knew it. I, I know your work. And there's just some quality to it that he, without reading a sign or anything, it's yours. So so we always look for those ways of um, just catching, you know, catching people's interest in the most ordinary thing in the world and, and, and allowing them to see it freshly with the, you know, the, the eyes of a child when they, when you see something new for the first time, that's a challenge because uh, water's all around us, but that's, that's really, that, that's the goal. Wow. So two final questions for you. I mean, you've accomplished what would be, you know, a massive degree of success by any measure. Um, how has your personal definition of success changed with age and life experience? Uh, um, well, and, and I, I think I share this with with uh, Steve Jobs and, and Walt Disney and, and a few other of the people that that are my um, heroes. And that is, I, I don't measure success by by piling up money. Now, I'm a capitalist, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to say that. And I and I and money is incredibly useful to have. Yeah. Uh, but I think if you do really great things and you have to work hard to, to get to that point, um, then, then you know, people are attracted to them and you can make money and that's what enables you to do uh, the next great thing. So I, I like to, in my own way and my with my own medium, and whenever I say I, I'm speaking for my whole team of several hundred people here, we, we love we love touching people. Uh, when you, you mentioned standing at the Bellagio, and you could look to your left while you're there, and it might be Rupert Murdoch with his billions standing on one side of you, and it might be a homeless person standing to to the other side, and they're both there. Neither of them paid a nickel to see that feature because our business model doesn't require the the ultimate viewer or user to to pay, and and they they're happy. And we see people all the time. They propose there. They hug each other. They hug strangers. I. Uh, we coined a phrase a little bit. What do we do here? Well, we don't really create fountains. We create um, magnets for human connection because you 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 connect with the people that you're with. It just makes you, I don't know, you feel good. Like we said, that, that essence of water. Um, you connect with your inner self, I think. I get very contemplative when I'm in, uh, I, it's kind of like when you go to, to you know, uh, the Muir Woods or something, when you're in a in an environment where you're just all inspired by something of nature, and seeing water on the scale, Bellagio certainly does that. And then you do you connect directly with nature itself, which is harder and harder to do because everything wants to be on a 4K res screen these days instead of the real thing. And we have not evolved to relate to things on screens to the degree we relate to the real stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. Beautiful. Well, I have one last question for you. Uh, which is how we finish all of our interviews at the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Uh, uh, to make something unmistakable? Yeah. 
uh, it, share with me just just a, a, a little more what you mean by on the yeah table. well it's, it's kind of funny when the moment that you said that somebody looked at something you did and they knew it was yours that is my oh. definition of unmistakable okay, right that's my yeah, personal yeah. definition right no that's perfect definition mean being meaning unique enough that it's it's not confused with anything else yeah <sighs> That's that, that I, I I I know you and I know you've asked that to some really amazing people. I th- I think you have to clear away all of the I'm gonna I'm gonna call them templates. You know we all work on Word and stuff, and everything's so much easier if you got a template. You just fill in the blanks, and I think that's one of the worst things in life. Uh, would you Would you propose to somebody? Would you Would you download some some proposal templates? Uh, would you know? I mean, the things that really matter in life have to be built word by word stick by stick um originally and then they then they will be unmistakable and i think most of us are uh, sophisticated enough that we can spot something that originated on a template i mean i'm i'm asked all the time mark why the heck do you, you, you do you spend all the time and it takes a lot of time choreographing one of these surely computers and ai and stuff they can figure out you know how to move the water to the music well that's because we don't move the water to the music we we're inspired by it and we create a set of moves that feel right for it but if you had the rockettes lined up and you 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 uh, computerized version of the rockettes and you said every time you hear a middle c you kick your left leg six inches high you, you that's what you'd get uh or and maybe some more interesting variation on that with ai but that would be you know, derived from a formula, an AI is just, just a massive series of interactive formulas. And I don't think the human mind is. So it, you, you start like a, with the classic statement, white sheet of paper, clear mind, not, not a variation on something you or somebody else has done. I mean, you, you're informed by that, but then you, you build it brick by brick, not uh, filling in the blanks between sentences that just have blanks here and there. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story, your wisdom, and your insights with our listeners. This has been fascinating. Uh, where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, and everything they're up to? Um, well, right now, you can probably catch us on a lot of the news shows and, and, and on our um, Instagram page and whatnot, because we just finished uh, a, a fantastic film, and I will say, um, I think it's the best work we've done in, in our whole life at the uh, Dubai Expo 2020. Uh, it's, it's totally different than anything we've ever done. It's got huge queue lines. I'm, I'm told it's the most popular uh, thing. In the, and the whole expo is fantastic and we're seeing it's the biggest and best exposition on the planet. Um, so so if, you, if you, the name of it is Surreal, S-U-R-R-E-A-L, or, or just, Dubai, just Dubai, found, uh, Dubai Expo Water Feature. And then our website, which is uh, wet design as one word, wetdesign.com, um, uh, either the mobile version or the laptop version. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.